Section 33 of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 33. Attack on Grand Gulf. OPERATIONS BELOW VICKSBURG On the 24th, my headquarters were with the advance at Perkins's plantation. Reconnaissances were made in boats to ascertain whether there was high land on the east shore of the river where we might land above Grand Gulf. There was none practicable. Accordingly, the troops were set in motion for hard times, twenty-two miles further down the river and nearly opposite Grand Gulf. The loss of two steamers and six barges reduced our transportation so that only ten thousand men could be moved by water. Some of the steamers that had got below were injured in their machinery, so that they were only useful as barges towed by those less severely injured. All the troops, therefore, except what could be transported in one trip, had to march. The road lay west of Lake St. Joseph. Three large bayous had to be crossed. They were rapidly bridged in the same manner as those previously encountered. On the 27th, McClernand's corps was all at hard times, and McPherson's was following closely. I had determined to make the attempt to effect a landing on the east side of the river as soon as possible. Accordingly, on the morning of the 29th, McClernand was directed to embark all the troops from his corps that our transports and barges could carry. About 10,000 men were so embarked. The plan was to have the Navy silence the guns at Grand Gulf, and to have as many men as possible ready to debark in the shortest possible time under cover of the fire of the navy and carry the works by storm the following order was issued perkins plantation louisiana april twenty seventh eighteen sixty three major general j a mcclernand commanding thirteenth army corps commence immediately the embarkation of your corps or so much of it as there is transportation for, have put aboard the artillery and every article authorized in orders limiting baggage except the men, and hold them in readiness, with their places assigned to be moved at a moment's warning. All the troops you may have, except those ordered to remain behind, send to a point nearly opposite Grand Gulf, where you see, by special orders of this date, General McPherson is ordered to send one division. The plan of the attack will be for the Navy to attack and silence all the batteries commanding the river. Your corps will be on the river, ready to run to and debark on the nearest eligible land below the promontory first brought to view passing down the river. Once on shore, have each commander instructed beforehand to form his men the best the ground will admit of and take possession of the most commanding points but avoid separating your command so that it cannot support itself the first object is to get a foothold where our troops can maintain themselves until such time as preparations can be made and troops collected for a forward movement Admiral Porter has proposed to place his boats in the position indicated to you a few days ago, and to bring over with them such troops as may be below the city after the guns of the enemy are silenced. It may be that the enemy will occupy positions back from the city, out of range of the gunboats, so as to make it desirable to run past Grand Gulf and land at Rodney. In case this should prove the plan, a signal will be arranged and you duly informed when the transports are to start with this view, or 
it may be expedient for the boats to run past but not the men in this case then the transports would have to be brought back to where the men could land and move by forced marches to below grand gulf re-embark rapidly and proceed to the latter place there will be required then three signals one to indicate that the transports can run down and debark the troops at grand gulf one that the transports can run by without the troops and the last that the transports can run by with the troops on board should the men have to march all baggage and artillery will be left to run the blockade if not already directed require your men to keep three days rations in their haversacks not to be touched until a movement commences u s grant major general at eight o'clock a m twenty ninth porter made the attack with his entire strength present eight gunboats for nearly five and a half hours the attack was kept up without silencing a single gun of the enemy all this time mcclernand's ten thousand men were huddled together on the transports in the stream ready to attempt a landing if signaled i occupied a tug from which i could see the effect of the battle on both sides within range of the enemy's guns but a small tug without armament was not calculated to attract the fire of batteries while they were being assailed themselves about half past one the fleet withdrew seeing their efforts were entirely unavailing the enemy ceased firing as soon as we withdrew i immediately signaled the admiral and went aboard his ship the navy lost in this engagement eighteen killed and fifty-six wounded a large proportion of these were of the crew of the flagship and most of these from a single shell which penetrated the ship's side and exploded between decks where the men were working their guns the sight of the mangled and dying men which met my eye as i boarded the ship was sickening grand gulf is on a high bluff where the river runs at the very foot of it it is as defensible upon its front as vicksburg and at that time would have been just as impossible to capture by a front attack i therefore requested porter to run the batteries with his fleet that night and to take charge of the transports all of which would be wanted below there is a long tongue of land from the louisiana side extending towards grand gulf made by the river running nearly east from about three miles above and nearly in the opposite direction from that point for about the same distance below the land was so low and wet that it would not have been practicable to march an army across but for a levee i had had this explored below as well as the east bank below to ascertain if there was a possible point of debarkation north of rodney it was found that the top of the levee afforded a good road to march upon porter as was always the case with him not only acquiesced in the plan but volunteered to use his entire fleet as transports i had intended to make this request but he anticipated me at dusk when concealed from the view of the enemy at grand gulf mcclernand landed his command on the west bank the navy and transports ran the batteries successfully the troops marched across the point of land under cover of night unobserved by the time it was light the enemy saw our whole fleet ironclads gunboats river steamers and barges quietly moving down the river three miles below them black or rather blue with national troops when the troops debarked the evening of the twenty ninth it was expected that we would have to go to rodney about nine miles below to find a landing but that night a colored man came in who informed me that a good landing would be found at bruinsburg a few miles above rodney from which point there was a good road leading to port gibson some twelve miles in the interior 
The information was found correct, and our landing was effected without opposition. Sherman had not left his position above Vicksburg yet. On the morning of the 27th, I ordered him to create a diversion by moving his corps up the Yazoo and threatening an attack on Haines's Bluff. My object was to compel Pemberton to keep as much force about Vicksburg as I could until I could secure a good footing on high land east of the river. The move was eminently successful and, as we afterwards learned, created great confusion about Vicksburg and doubts about our real design. Sherman moved the day of our attack on Grand Gulf, the 29th, with ten regiments of his command and eight gunboats, which Porter had left above Vicksburg. He debarked his troops and apparently made every preparation to attack the enemy while the Navy bombarded the main forts at Haines's Bluff. This move was made without a single casualty in either branch of the service. On the 1st of May, Sherman received orders from me, sent from hard times the evening of the 29th of April, to withdraw from the front of Haines's Bluff and follow McPherson with two divisions as fast as he could. I had established a depot of supplies at Perkins's plantation. Now that all our gunboats were below Grand Gulf, it was possible that the enemy might fit out boats in the Big Black with improvised armament and attempt to destroy these supplies. McPherson was at hard times with a portion of his corps, and the depot was protected by a part of his command. The night of the 29th I directed him to arm one of the transports with artillery and send it up to Perkins's plantation as a guard, and also to have the siege guns we had brought along moved there and put in position. The embarkation below Grand Gulf took place at Deshroons, Louisiana, six miles above Bruinsburg, Mississippi. Early on the morning of 30th of April, McClernand's Corps and one division of McPherson's Corps were speedily landed. When this was effected, I felt a degree of relief scarcely ever equaled since. Vicksburg was not yet taken, it is true, nor were its defenders demoralized by any of our previous moves. I was now in the enemy's country, with a vast river and the stronghold of Vicksburg between me and my base of supplies, but I was on dry ground on the same side of the river with the enemy. All the campaigns, labors, hardships, and exposures from the month of December previous to this time that had been made and endured were for the accomplishment of this one object. I had with me the 13th Corps, General McClernand commanding, and two brigades of Logan's division of the 17th Corps, General McPherson commanding, in all not more than 20,000 men to commence the campaign with. These were soon reinforced by the remaining brigade of Logan's division and Crocker's division of the 17th Corps. On the 7th of May I was further reinforced by Sherman with two divisions of his, the 15th Corps, my total force was then about 33,000 men. The enemy occupied Grand Gulf, Haines's Bluff, and Jackson, with a force of nearly 60,000 men. Jackson is 50 miles east of Vicksburg and is connected with it by a railroad. My first problem was to capture Grand Gulf to use as a base. Bruinsburg is two miles from high ground. The bottom at that point is higher than most of the low land in the valley of the Mississippi, and a good road leads to the bluff. It was natural to expect the garrison from Grand Gulf to come out to meet us, and prevent, if they could, our reaching this solid base. Bayou Pierre enters the Mississippi just above Bruinsburg, and, as it is a navigable stream, and was high at the time, in order to intercept us, 
they had to go by port gibson the nearest point where there was a bridge to cross upon this more than doubled the distance from grand gulf to the high land back of bruinsburg no time was to be lost in securing this foothold our transportation was not sufficient to move all the army across the river at one trip or even two but the landing of the thirteenth corps and one division of the seventeenth was effected during the day april thirtieth and early evening mcclernand was advanced as soon as ammunition and two days rations to last five could be issued to his men the bluffs were reached an hour before sunset and mcclernand was pushed on hoping to reach port gibson and save the bridge spanning the bayou pierre before the enemy could get there for crossing a stream in the presence of an enemy is always difficult port gibson too is the starting point of roads to grand gulf vicksburg and jackson mcclernand's advance met the enemy about five miles west of port gibson at thompson's plantation there was some firing during the night but nothing rising to the dignity of a battle until daylight the enemy had taken a strong natural position with most of the grand gulf garrison numbering about seven or eight thousand men under general bowen his hope was to hold me in check until reinforcements under loring could reach him from vicksburg but loring did not come in time to render much assistance south of port gibson two brigades of mcpherson's corps followed mcclernand as fast as rations and ammunition could be issued and were ready to take position upon the battlefield whenever the thirteenth corps could be got out of the way the country in this part of mississippi stands on edge as it were the roads running along the ridges except when they occasionally pass from one ridge to another where there are no clearings the sides of the hills are covered with a very heavy growth of timber and with undergrowth and the ravines are filled with vines and cane brakes almost impenetrable this makes it easy for an inferior force to delay if not defeat a far superior one near the point selected by bowen to defend the road to port gibson divides taking two ridges which do not diverge more than a mile or two at the widest point these roads unite just outside the town this made it necessary for mcclernand to divide his force it was not only divided but it was separated by a deep ravine of the character above described one flank could not reinforce the other except by marching back to the junction of the roads mcclernand put the divisions of hovey carr and a j smith upon the right hand branch and osterhaus on the left i was on the field by ten a m and inspected both flanks in person on the right the enemy if not being pressed back was at least not repulsing our advance on the left however osterhaus was not faring so well he had been repulsed with some loss as soon as the road could be cleared of mcclernand's troops i ordered up mcpherson who was close upon the rear of the thirteenth corps with two brigades of logan's division this was about noon i ordered him to send one brigade general john e smith's was selected to support osterhaus and to move to the left and flank the enemy out of his position this movement carried the brigade over a deep ravine to a third ridge and when smith's troops were seen well through the ravine osterhaus was directed to renew his front attack it was successful and unattended by heavy loss the enemy was sent in full retreat on their right and their left followed before sunset while the movement to our left was going on mcclernand who was with his right flank sent me frequent requests for reinforcements although the force with him was not being pressed i had been upon the ground and knew it did not admit of his engaging all the men he had we followed up our victory until night overtook us about two miles from port gibson 
Then the troops went into bivouac for the night. End of section 33. Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas. Jim at J-O-C-C-L-E-V dot com. Thirty-four of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter Thirty-four. Capture of Port Gibson. Grierson's Raid, Occupation of Grand Gulf, Movement Up the Big Black, Battle of Raymond. We started next morning for Port Gibson as soon as it was light enough to see the road. We were soon in the town, and I was delighted to find that the enemy had not stopped to contest our crossing further at the bridge which he had burned. The troops were set to work at once to construct a bridge across the south fork of the Bayou Pierre. At this time the water was high and the current rapid. What might be called a raft bridge was soon constructed from material obtained from wooden buildings, stables, fences, etc., which sufficed for carrying the whole army over safely. Colonel J. H. Wilson, a member of my staff, planned and superintended the construction of this bridge, going into the water and working as hard as anyone engaged. Officers and men, generally, joined in this work. When it was finished, the army crossed and marched eight miles beyond to the North Fork that day. One brigade of Logan's division was sent down the stream to occupy the attention of a rebel battery which had been left behind with infantry supports to prevent our repairing the burnt railroad bridge. Two of his brigades were sent up the bayou to find a crossing and reach the north fork to repair the bridge there. The enemy soon left when he found we were building a bridge elsewhere. Before leaving Port Gibson, we were reinforced by Crocker's division, McPherson's corps, which had crossed the Mississippi at Bruinsburg and come up without stopping except to get two days' rations. McPherson still had one division west of the Mississippi River, guarding the road from Milliken's Bend to the river below until Sherman's command should relieve it. On leaving Bruinsburg for the front, I left my son Frederick, who had joined me a few weeks before, on board one of the gunboats asleep and hoped to get away without him until after Grand Gulf should fall into our hands. But on waking up he learned that I had gone, and being guided by the sound of the battle raging at Thompson's Hill, called the Battle of Port Gibson, found his way to where I was. He had no horse to ride at the time, and I had no facilities for even preparing a meal. He, therefore, foraged around the best he could until we reached Grand Gulf. Mr. C. A. Dana, then an officer of the War Department, accompanied me on the Vicksburg campaign and through a portion of the siege. He was in the same situation as Fred, so far as transportation and mess arrangements were concerned. The first time I called to mind, seeing either of them, after the battle, they were mounted on two enormous horses, grown white from age, each equipped with dilapidated saddles and bridles. Our trains arrived a few days later, after which we were all perfectly equipped. My son accompanied me throughout the campaign and siege, and caused no anxiety either to me or to his mother, who was at home. He looked out for himself, and was, in every battle of the campaign. His age, then not quite thirteen, enabled him to take in all he saw, and to retain a recollection of it that would not be possible in more mature years. When the movement from Bruinsburg commenced, we were without a wagon train. The train, still west of the Mississippi, was carried around with proper escort, 
by a circuitous route from Milliken's Bend to Hard Times, seventy or more miles below, and did not get up for some days after the Battle of Port Gibson. My own horses, headquarters' transportation, servants, mess chests, and everything except what I had on was with this train. General A. J. Smith happened to have an extra horse at Bruinsburg, which I borrowed, with a saddle tree without upholstering further than stirrups. I had no other for nearly a week. It was necessary to have transportation for ammunition. Provisions could be taken from the country, but all the ammunition that can be carried on the person is soon exhausted when there is much fighting. I directed, therefore, immediately on landing that all the vehicles and draft animals whether horses mules or oxen in the vicinity should be collected and loaded to their capacity with ammunition quite a train was collected during the thirtieth and a motley train it was in it could be found fine carriages loaded nearly to the top with boxes of cartridges that had been pitched in promiscuously drawn by mules with plough harness, straw collars, rope lines, etc. Long coupled wagons with racks for carrying cotton bales, drawn by oxen, and everything that could be found in the way of transportation on a plantation, either for use or pleasure. The making out of provision returns was stopped for the time. No formalities were to retard our progress until a position was secured when the time could be spared to observe them. It was at Port Gibson I first heard, through a southern paper, of the complete success of Colonel Grierson, who was making a raid through central Mississippi. He had started from LaGrange, April 17th, with three regiments of about 1,700 men. On the 21st he had detached Colonel Hatch, with one regiment to destroy the railroad between Columbus and Macon, and then return to LaGrange. Hatch had a sharp fight with the enemy at Columbus, and retreated along the railroad, destroying it at Okalona and Tupelo, and arriving in LaGrange April 26. Grierson continued his movement with about 1,000 men, breaking the Vicksburg and Meridian Railroad and the New Orleans and Jackson Railroad, arriving at Baton Rouge May 2nd. This raid was of great importance, for Grierson had attracted the attention of the enemy from the main movement against Vicksburg. During the night of the 2nd of May, the bridge over the North Fork was repaired, and the troops commenced crossing at five the next morning. Before the leading brigade was over, it was fired upon by the enemy from a commanding position, but they were soon driven off. It was evident that the enemy was covering a retreat from Grand Gulf to Vicksburg. Every commanding position from this, Grindstone, crossing to Hankinson's Ferry over the Big Black, was occupied by the retreating foe to delay our progress. McPherson, however, reached Hankinson's ferry before night, seized the ferry boat, and sent a detachment of his command across and several miles north on the road to Vicksburg. When the junction of the road going to Vicksburg with the road from Grand Gulf to Raymond and Jackson was reached, Logan, with his division was turned to the left towards Grand Gulf. I went with him a short distance from this junction. McPherson had encountered the largest force yet met since the Battle of Port Gibson, and had a skirmish nearly approaching a battle, but the road Logan had taken enabled him to come up on the enemy's right flank, and they soon gave way. McPherson was ordered to hold Hankinson's ferry and the road back to Willow Springs with one division. McClernand, who was now in the rear, was to join in this as well as to guard the line back down the bayou. I did not want to take the chances of having an enemy lurking in our rear. On the way from the junction to Grand Gulf, 
where the road comes into the one from Vicksburg to the same place six or seven miles out, I learned that the last of the enemy had retreated past that place on their way to Vicksburg. I left Logan to make the proper disposition of his troops for the night, while I rode into the town with an escort of about twenty cavalry. Admiral Porter had already arrived with his fleet. The enemy had abandoned his heavy guns, and evacuated the place. When I reached Grand Gulf, May 3rd, I had not been with my baggage since the 27th of April, and, consequently, had had no change of underclothing, no meal except such as I could pick up sometimes at other headquarters, and no tent to cover me. The first thing I did was to get a bath borrow some fresh underclothing from one of the naval officers and get a good meal on the flagship then i wrote letters to the general-in-chief informing him of our present position dispatches to be telegraphed from cairo orders to general sullivan commanding above vicksburg and gave orders to all my corps commanders about twelve o'clock at night I was through my work and started for Hankinson's Ferry, arriving there before daylight. While at Grand Gulf, I heard from Banks, who was on the Red River, and who said that he could not be at Port Hudson before the 10th of May, and then with only 15,000 men. Up to this time, my intention had been to secure Grand Gulf as a base of supplies, detach mcclernand's corps to banks and cooperate with him in the reduction of port hudson the news from banks forced upon me a different plan of campaign from the one intended to wait for his cooperation would have detained me at least a month the reinforcements would not have reached ten thousand men after deducting casualties and necessary river guards at all high points close to the river for over three hundred miles the enemy would have strengthened his position and been reinforced by more men than banks could have brought i therefore determined to move independently of banks cut loose from my base destroy the rebel force in rear of vicksburg and invest or capture the city grand gulf was accordingly given up as a base and the authorities at washington were notified i knew well that halleck's caution would lead him to disapprove of this course but it was the only one that gave any chance of success the time it would take to communicate with washington and get a reply would be so great that i could not be interfered with until it was demonstrated whether my plan was practicable even sherman who afterwards ignored bases of supplies other than what were afforded by the country while marching through four states of the confederacy with an army more than twice as large as mine at this time wrote me from hankinson's ferry advising me of the impossibility of supplying our army over a single road he urged me to stop all troops till your army is partially supplied with wagons and then act as quick as possible for this road will be jammed as sure as life to this i replied I do not calculate upon the possibility of supplying the army with full rations from Grand Gulf. I know it will be impossible without constructing additional roads. What I do expect is to get up what rations of hard bread, coffee, and salt we can, and make the country furnish the balance. We started from Bruinsburg with an average of about two days' rations, and received no more from our own supplies for some days abundance was found in the meantime a delay would give the enemy time to reinforce and fortify mcclernand's and mcpherson's commands were kept substantially as they were on the night of the second awaiting supplies sufficient to give them three days rations in haversacks beef mutton poultry and forage were found in abundance 
quite a quantity of bacon and molasses was also secured from the country but bread and coffee could not be obtained in quantity sufficient for all the men every plantation however had a run of stone propelled by mule power to grind corn for the owners and their slaves all these were kept running while we were stopping day and night and when we were marching during the night at all plantations covered by the troops but the product was taken by the troops nearest by so that the majority of the command was destined to go without bread until a new base was established on the yazoo above vicksburg while the troops were awaiting the arrival of rations i ordered reconnaissances made by mcclernand and mcpherson with the view of leading the enemy to believe that we intended to cross the big black and attack the city at once on the sixth sherman arrived at grand gulf and crossed his command that night and the next day three days rations had been brought up from grand gulf for the advanced troops and were issued orders were given for a forward movement the next day sherman was directed to order up blair who had been left behind to guard the road from milliken's bend to hard times with two brigades the quartermaster at young's point was ordered to send two hundred wagons with blair and the commissary was to load them with hard bread coffee sugar salt and one hundred thousand pounds of salt meat on the third hurlbut who had been left at memphis was ordered to send four regiments from his command to milliken's bend to relieve blair's division and on the fifth he was ordered to send lauman's division in addition the latter to join the army in the field the four regiments were to be taken from troops near the river so that there would be no delay during the night of the sixth mcpherson drew in his troops north of the big black and was off at an early hour on the road to jackson via rocky springs utica and raymond that night he and mcclernand were both at rocky springs ten miles from hankins's ferry mcpherson remained there during the eighth while mcclernand moved to big sandy and sherman marched from grand gulp to hankinson's ferry the ninth mcpherson moved to a point within a few miles west of utica mcclernand and sherman remained where they were on the tenth mcpherson moved to utica sherman to big sandy mcclernand was still at big sandy the eleventh mcclernand was at five mile creek sherman at auburn mcpherson five miles advanced from utica may twelfth mcclernand was at fourteen mile creek sherman at fourteen mile creek mcpherson at raymond after a battle after mcpherson crossed the big black at hankinson's ferry vicksburg could have been approached and besieged by the south side it is not probable however that pemberton would have permitted a close besiegement the broken nature of the ground would have enabled him to hold a strong defensible line from the river south of the city to the big black retaining possession of the railroad back to that point it was my plan therefore to get to the railroad east of vicksburg and approach from that direction accordingly mcpherson's troops that had crossed the big black were withdrawn and the movement east to jackson commenced as has been stated before the country is very much broken and the roads generally confined to the tops of the hills the troops were moved one sometimes two corps at a time to reach designated points out parallel to the railroad and only from six to ten miles from it mcclernand's corps was kept with its left flank on the big black guarding all the crossings fourteen mile creek a stream substantially parallel with the railroad was reached and crossings effected by mcclernand and sherman with slight loss mcpherson was to the right of sherman 
extending to Raymond. The cavalry was used in this advance in reconnoitering to find the roads, to cover our advance and to find the most practicable routes from one command to another so they could support each other in case of an attack. In making this move, I estimated Pemberton's movable force at Vicksburg at about 18,000 men, with smaller forces at Haines's Bluff and Jackson. It would not be possible for Pemberton to attack me with all his troops at one place, and I determined to throw my army between his and fight him in detail. This was done with success, but I found afterwards that I had entirely underestimated Pemberton's strength. Up to this point, our movements had been made without serious opposition. My line was now nearly parallel with the Jackson and Vicksburg Railroad, and about seven miles south of it. The right was at Raymond, eighteen miles from Jackson, McPherson commanding, Sherman in the center on 14 Mile Creek, his advance thrown across. McClernand to the left, also on 14 Mile Creek, advance across, and his pickets within two miles of Edwards' station, where the enemy had concentrated a considerable force and where they undoubtedly expected us to attack. McClernand's left was on the Big Black. In all our moves, up to this time, the left had hugged the big black closely, and all the ferries had been guarded to prevent the enemy throwing a force on our rear. McPherson encountered the enemy, 5,000 strong, with two batteries under General Gregg, about two miles out of Raymond. This was about 2 p.m. Logan was in advance with one of his brigades, he deployed and moved up to engage the enemy. McPherson ordered the road in rear to be cleared of wagons, and the balance of Logan's division and Crocker's, which was still further in rear, to come forward with all dispatch. The order was obeyed with alacrity. Logan got his division in position for assault before Crocker could get up, and attacked with vigor carrying the enemy's position easily, sending Gregg flying from the field not to appear against our front again until we met at Jackson. In this battle, McPherson lost 66 killed, 339 wounded, and 37 missing, nearly or quite all from Logan's division. The enemy's loss was 100 killed, 305 wounded, besides 415 taken prisoners. I regarded Logan and Crocker as being as competent division commanders as could be found in or out of the army and both equal to a much higher command. Crocker, however, was dying of consumption when he volunteered. His weak condition never put him on the sick report when there was a battle in prospect as long as he could keep on his feet. He died not long after the close of the rebellion. End of section 34 Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas, Jim at J-O-C-C-L-E-V dot com Five of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger, Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant, by Ulysses S. Grant, Chapter 35. Movement Against Jackson, Fall of Jackson, Intercepting the Enemy, Battle of Champions Hill, when the news reached me of McPherson's victory at Raymond about sundown, my position was with Sherman. I decided at once to turn the whole column towards Jackson and capture that place without delay. Pemberton was now on my left with, as I supposed, about 18,000 men, in fact, 
as I learned afterwards, with nearly 50,000. A force was also collecting on my right, at Jackson, the point where all the railroads communicating with Vicksburg connect. All the enemy's supplies of men and stores would come by that point. As I hoped in the end to besiege Vicksburg, I must first destroy all possibility of aid. I therefore determined to move swiftly towards Jackson, destroy or drive any force in that direction, and then turn upon Pemberton. But by moving against Jackson, I uncovered my own communication. So I finally decided to have none, to cut loose altogether from my base and move my whole force eastward. I then had no fears for my communications, and if I moved quickly enough, could turn upon Pemberton before he could attack me in the rear. Accordingly, all previous orders given during the day for movements on the 13th were annulled by new ones. McPherson was ordered at daylight to move on Clinton, ten miles from Jackson, Sherman was notified of my determination to capture Jackson and work from there westward. He was ordered to start at four in the morning and march to Raymond. McClernand was ordered to march with three divisions by Dillon's to Raymond. One was left to guard the crossing of the Big Black. On the 10th, I had received a letter from Banks on the Red River asking reinforcements. Porter had gone to his assistance with a part of his fleet on the 3rd, and I now wrote to him describing my position and declining to send any troops. I looked upon side movements, as long as the enemy held Port Hudson and Vicksburg, as a waste of time and material. General Joseph E. Johnston arrived at Jackson in the night of the 13th from Tennessee, and immediately assumed command of all the Confederate troops in Mississippi. I knew he was expecting reinforcements from the south and east. On the 6th, I had written to General Halleck. Information from the other side leads me to believe the enemy are bringing forces from Tallahoma. Up to this time, my troops had been kept in supporting distances of each other, as far as the nature of the country would admit. Reconnaissances were constantly made from each corps to enable them to acquaint themselves with the most practicable routes from one to another in case a union became necessary. McPherson reached Clinton with the advance early on the 13th and immediately set to work destroying the railroad. Sherman's advance reached Raymond before the last of McPherson's command had got out of the town. McClernand withdrew from the front of the enemy at Edwards' station with much skill and without loss, and reached his position for the night in good order. On the night of the 13th, McPherson was ordered to march at early dawn upon Jackson only fifteen miles away. Sherman was given the same order but he was to move by the direct road from Raymond to Jackson, which is south of the road McPherson was on, and does not approach within two miles of it at the point where it crossed the line of entrenchments which, at that time, defended the city. McClernand was ordered to move one division of his command to Clinton, one division a few miles beyond Mississippi Springs following Sherman's line, and a third to Raymond. He was also directed to send his siege guns, four in number with the troops going by Mississippi Springs. McClernand's position was an advantageous one in any event. With one division at Clinton, he was in position to reinforce McPherson at Jackson, rapidly if it became necessary. The division beyond Mississippi Springs was equally available to reinforce Sherman. The one at Raymond could take either road. He still had two other divisions further back, now that Blair had come up, available within a day at Jackson. If this last command should not be wanted at Jackson, they were already one day's march from there on their way to Vicksburg, and on three different roads leading to the latter city. 
but the most important consideration in my mind was to have a force confronting Pemberton if he should come out to attack my rear. This I expected him to do, as shown further on. He was directed by Johnston to make this very move. I notified General Halleck that I should attack the state capital on the 14th. A courier carried the dispatch to Grand Gulf through an unprotected country. Sherman and McPherson communicated with each other during the night and arranged to reach Jackson at about the same hour. It rained in torrents during the night of the 13th and the fore part of the day of the 14th. The roads were intolerable and in some places on Sherman's line, where the land was low, they were covered more than a foot deep with water, but the troops never murmured. By nine o'clock, Crocker, of McPherson's Corps, who was now in advance, came upon the enemy's pickets and speedily drove them in upon the main body. They were outside of the entrenchments in a strong position and proved to be the troops that had been driven out of Raymond. Johnston had been reinforced during the night by Georgia and South Carolina regiments, so that his force amounted to 11,000 men, and he was expecting still more. Sherman also came upon the rebel pickets some distance out from the town, but speedily drove them in. He was now on the south and southwest of Jackson, confronting the Confederates behind their breastworks, while McPherson's right was nearly two miles north, occupying a line running north and south across the Vicksburg Railroad. Artillery was brought up, and reconnaissances made preparatory to an assault. McPherson brought up Logan's division, while he deployed Crocker's for the assault. Sherman made similar dispositions on the right. By 11 a.m. both were ready to attack. Crocker moved his division forward, preceded by a strong skirmish line. These troops at once encountered the enemy's advance and drove it back on the main body when they returned to their proper regiment, and the whole division charged, routing the enemy completely and driving him into this main line. This stand by the enemy was made more than two miles outside of his main fortifications. McPherson followed up with his command until within range of the guns of the enemy from their entrenchments, when he halted to bring his troops into line and reconnoiter to determine the next move. It was now about noon. While this was going on, Sherman was confronting a rebel battery, which enfiladed the road on which he was marching, the Mississippi Springs Road, and commanded a bridge spanning a stream over which he had to pass. By detaching right and left, the stream was forced, and the enemy flanked and speedily driven within the main line. This brought our whole line in front of the enemy's line of works, which was continuous on the north, west, and south sides from the Pearl River north of the city to the same river south. I was with Sherman. He was confronted by a force sufficient to hold us back. Appearances did not justify an assault where we were. I had directed Sherman to send a force to the right and to reconnoiter as far as to the Pearl River. This force, Tuttle's division, not returning, I rode to the right with my staff and soon found that the enemy had left that part of the line. Tuttle's movement, or McPherson's pressure, had, no doubt, led Johnston to order a retreat, leaving only the men at the guns to retard us while he was getting away. Tuttle had seen this, and, passing through the lines without resistance, came up in the rear of the artillerists confronting Sherman, and captured them with ten pieces of artillery. I rode immediately to the State House, where I was soon followed by Sherman. About the same time McPherson discovered that the enemy was leaving his front, and advanced Crocker, who was so close upon the enemy that they could not move their guns or destroy them. 
he captured seven guns and moving on hoisted the national flag over the rebel capital of mississippi stevenson's brigade was sent to cut off the rebel retreat but was too late or not expeditious enough our loss in this engagement was mcpherson thirty seven killed two hundred twenty eight wounded sherman four killed and twenty one wounded and missing the enemy lost eight hundred forty five killed wounded and captured seventeen guns fell into our hands and the enemy destroyed by fire their storehouses containing a large amount of commissary stores on this day blair reached new auburn and joined mcclernand's fourth division he had with him two hundred wagons loaded with rations the only commissary supplies received during the entire campaign i slept that night in the room that johnston was said to have occupied the night before about four in the afternoon i sent for the corps commanders and directed the disposition to be made of their troops sherman was to remain in jackson until he destroyed that place as a railroad center and manufacturing city of military supplies he did the work most effectually sherman and i went together into a manufactory which had not ceased work on account of the battle nor for the entrance of yankee troops our presence did not seem to attract the attention of either the manager or the operatives most of whom were girls we looked on for a while to see the tent cloth which they were making roll out of the looms with c s a woven in each bolt there was an immense amount of cotton in bales stacked outside finally i told sherman i thought they had done work enough the operatives were told they could leave and take with them what cloth they could carry in a few minutes cotton and factory were in a blaze the proprietor visited Washington while I was president to get his pay for his property, claiming that it was private. He asked me to give him a statement of the fact that his property had been destroyed by national troops so that he might use it with Congress, where he was pressing, or proposed to press, his claim. I declined. On the night of the 13th, johnston sent the following dispatch to pemberton at edwards's station i have lately arrived and learned that major general sherman is between us with four divisions at clinton it is important to establish communication that you may be reinforced if practicable come up in his rear at once to beat such a detachment would be of immense value all the troops you can quickly assemble should be brought time is all important this dispatch was sent in triplicate by different messengers one of the messengers happened to be a loyal man who had been expelled from memphis some months before by hurlbut for uttering disloyal and threatening sentiments there was a good deal of parade about his expulsion ostensibly as a warning to those who entertained the sentiments he expressed but hurlbut and the expelled man understood each other he delivered his copy of johnston's dispatch to mcpherson who forwarded it to me receiving this dispatch on the fourteenth i ordered mcpherson to move promptly in the morning back to bolton the nearest point where johnston could reach the road bolton is about twenty miles west of jackson i also informed mcclernand of the capture of jackson and sent him the following order it is evidently the design of the enemy to get north of us and cross the big black and beat us into vicksburg we must not allow them to do this turn all your forces towards bolton station and make all dispatch in getting there move troops by the most direct road from wherever they may be on the receipt of this order and to blair i wrote their design is evidently to cross the big black 
and pass down the peninsula between the Big Black and Yazoo rivers. We must beat them. Turn your troops immediately to Bolton. Take all the trains with you. Smith's division and any other troops now with you will go to the same place. If practicable, take parallel roads so as to divide your troops and train. Johnston stopped on the Canton Road, only six miles north of Jackson, the night of the 14th. He sent from there to Pemberton dispatches announcing the loss of Jackson and the following order. As soon as the reinforcements are all up, they must be united to the rest of the army. I am anxious to see a force assembled that may be able to inflict a heavy blow upon the enemy. Can Grant supply himself from the Mississippi? Can you not cut him off from it, and above all, should he be compelled to fall back for one of supplies, beat him? The concentration of my troops was easy, considering the character of the country, McPherson moved along the road parallel with and near the railroad. McClernand's command was one division, Hovey's, on the road McPherson had to take, but with a start of four miles. One, Osterhaus, was at Raymond on a converging road that intersected the other near Champions Hill. One, Cars, had to pass over the same road with Osterhaus but being back at mississippi springs would not be detained by it the fourth smith's with blair's division was near auburn with a different road to pass over mcclernand faced about and moved promptly his cavalry from raymond seized bolton by half past nine in the morning driving out the enemy's pickets and capturing several men the night of the fifteenth Hovey was at Bolton. Carr and Oster House were about three miles south, but abreast, facing west. Smith was north of Raymond, with Blair in his rear. McPherson's command, with Logan in front, had marched at seven o'clock, and by four reached Hovey and went into camp. Crocker bivouacked just in Hovey's rear on the Clinton Road. Sherman, with two divisions, was in Jackson completing the destruction of roads, bridges, and military factories. I rode in person out to Clinton. On my arrival, I ordered McClernand to move early in the morning on Edwards' station, cautioning him to watch for the enemy and not bring on an engagement unless he felt very certain of success. I naturally expected that Pemberton would endeavor to obey the orders of his superior, which I have shown were to attack us at Clinton. This, indeed, I knew he could not do, but I felt sure he would make the attempt to reach that point. It turned out, however, that he had decided his superior's plans were impracticable, and consequently determined to move south from Edwards' station and get between me and my base. I, however, had no base, having abandoned it more than a week before. On the 15th, Pemberton had actually marched south from Edwards' station, but the rains had swollen Baker's Creek, which he had to cross so much that he could not ford it, and the bridges were washed away. This brought him back to the Jackson Road, on which there was a good bridge over Baker's Creek. Some of his troops were marching until midnight to get there. Receiving here, early on the 16th, a repetition of his order to join Johnston at Clinton, he concluded to obey, and sent a dispatch to his chief, informing him of the route by which he might be expected. About five o'clock in the morning, 16th, two men, who had been employed on the Jackson and Vicksburg Railroad, were brought to me. They reported that they had passed through Pemberton's army in the night, and that it was still marching east. They reported him to have eighty regiments of infantry and ten batteries, in all about twenty-five thousand men. 
I had expected to leave Sherman at Jackson another day in order to complete his work, but getting the above information I sent him orders to move with all dispatch to Bolton and to put one division with an ammunition train on the road at once with directions to its commander to march with all possible speed until he came up to our rear. Within an hour after receiving this order, Steele's division was on the road. At the same time, I dispatched to Blair, who was near Auburn, to move with all speed to Edwards' station. McClernand was directed to embrace Blair in his command for the present. Blair's division was a part of the 15th Army Corps, Sherman's, but as it was on its way to join its corps, it naturally struck out left first, now that we had faced about and were moving west. The 15th Corps, when it got up, would be on our extreme right. McPherson was directed to get his trains out of the way of the troops and to follow Hovey's division as closely as possible. McClernand had two roads about three miles apart, converging at Edwards' station over which to march his troops. Hovey's division of his corps had the advance on a third road, the Clinton, still further north. McClernand was directed to move Blair's and A. J. Smith's divisions by the southernmost of these roads, and Osterhaus and Carr by the middle road. Orders were to move cautiously with skirmishers to the front to feel for the enemy. Smith's division on the most southern road was the first to encounter the enemy's pickets, who were speedily driven in. Osterhaus, on the middle road, hearing the firing, pushed his skirmishes forward, found the enemy's pickets, and forced them back to the main line. About the same time, Hovey encountered the enemy on the northern or direct wagon road from Jackson to Vicksburg. McPherson was hastening up to join Hovey, but was embarrassed by Hovey's trains occupying the roads. I was still back at Clinton. McPherson sent me word of the situation and expressed the wish that I was up. By half-past seven, I was on the road and proceeded rapidly to the front, ordering all trains that were in front of troops off the road. When I arrived, Hovey's skirmishing amounted almost to a battle. McClernand was in person on the middle road and had a shorter distance to march to reach the enemy's position than McPherson. I sent him word by a staff officer to push forward and attack. These orders were repeated several times without apparently expediting McClernand's advance. Champions Hill where Pemberton had chosen his position to receive us, whether taken by accident or design, was well selected. It is one of the highest points in that section, and commanded all the ground in range. On the east side of the ridge, which is quite precipitous, is a ravine running first north, then westerly, terminating at Baker's Creek. It was grown up thickly with large trees and undergrowth, making it difficult to penetrate with troops even when not defended. The ridge occupied by the enemy terminated abruptly, where the ravine turns westerly. The left of the enemy occupied the north end of this ridge. The Bolton and Edwards' station wagon road turns almost due south at this point, and ascends the ridge which it follows for about a mile then turning west descends by a gentle declivity to baker's creek nearly a mile away on the west side the slope of the ridge is gradual and is cultivated from near the summit to the creek there was when we were there a narrow belt of timber near the summit west of the road from Raymond, there is a direct road to Edwards' station, some three miles west of Champions Hill. There is one also to Bolton. 
from this latter road there is still another leaving it about three and a half miles before reaching bolton and leads direct to the same station it was along these two roads that three divisions of mcclernand's corps and blair of sherman's temporarily under mcclernand were moving hovey of mcclernand's command was with mcpherson further north on the road from bolton direct to edwards's station the middle road comes into the northern road at the point where the latter turns to the west and descends to baker's creek the southern road is still several miles south and does not intersect the others until it reaches edwards's station pemberton's lines covered all these roads and faced east hovey's line when it first drove in the enemy's pickets was formed parallel to that of the enemy and confronted his left by eleven o'clock the skirmishing had grown into a hard contested battle hovey alone before other troops could be got to assist him had captured a battery of the enemy but he was not able to hold his position and had to abandon the artillery mcpherson brought up his troops as fast as possible logan in front and posted them on the right of hovey and across the flank of the enemy logan reinforced hovey with one brigade from his division with his other two he moved further west to make room for crocker who was coming up as rapidly as the roads would admit hovey was still being heavily pressed and was calling on me for more reinforcements i ordered crocker who was now coming up to send one brigade from his division mcpherson ordered two batteries to be stationed where they nearly enfiladed the enemy's line and they did good execution from logan's position now a direct forward movement carried him over open fields in rear of the enemy and in a line parallel with them he did make exactly this move attacking however the enemy through the belt of woods covering the west slope of the hill for a short distance up to this time i had kept my position near hovey where we were the most heavily pressed but about noon i moved with a part of my staff by our right around until i came up with logan himself i found him near the road leading down to baker's creek he was actually in command of the only road over which the enemy could retreat hovey reinforced by two brigades from mcpherson's command confronted the enemy's left crocker with two brigades covered their left flank mcclernand two hours before had been within two miles and a half of their center with two divisions and the two divisions blair's and a j smith's were confronting the rebel right ransom with a brigade of MacArthur's division of the seventeenth corps mcpherson's had crossed the river at grand gulf a few days before and was coming up on their right flank neither logan nor i knew that we had cut off the retreat of the enemy just at this juncture a messenger came from hovey asking for more reinforcements there were none to spare i then gave an order to move mcpherson's command by the left flank around to hovey this uncovered the rebel line of retreat which was soon taken advantage of by the enemy during all this time hovey reinforced as he was by a brigade from logan and another from crocker and by crocker gallantly coming up with two other brigades on his right had made several assaults the last one about the time the road was opened to the rear the enemy fled precipitately this was between three and four o'clock i rode forward or rather back to where the middle road intersects the north road and found the skirmishers of carr's division just coming in osterhaus was further south and soon after came up with skirmishers advanced in like manner hovey's division and mcpherson's two divisions with him 
had marched and fought from early dawn and were not in the best condition to follow the retreating foe i sent orders to osterhaus to pursue the enemy and to carr whom i saw personally i explained the situation and directed him to pursue vigorously as far as the big black and to cross it if he could osterhaus to follow him the pursuit was continued until after dark the battle of champions hill lasted about four hours hard fighting preceded by two or three hours of skirmishing some of which almost rose to the dignity of battle every man of hovey's division and of mcpherson's two divisions was engaged during the battle no other part of my command was engaged at all except that as described before osterhaus's and a j smith's divisions had encountered the rebel advanced pickets as early as half past seven their positions were admirable for advancing upon the enemy's line mcclernand with two divisions was within a few miles of the battlefield long before noon and in easy hearing i sent him repeated orders by staff officers fully competent to explain to him the situation these traversed the wood separating us without escort and directed him to push forward but he did not come it is true in front of mcclernand there was a small force of the enemy and posted in a good position behind a ravine obstructing his advance but if he had moved to the right by the road my staff officers had followed the enemy must either have fallen back or been cut off instead of this he sent orders to hovey who belonged to his corps to join on to his right flank hovey was bearing the brunt of the battle at the time to obey the order he would have had to pull out from the front of the enemy and march back as far as mcclernand had to advance to get into battle and substantially over the same ground of course i did not permit hovey to obey the order of his immediate superior we had in this battle about fifteen thousand men absolutely engaged this excludes those that did not get up all of mcclernand's command except hovey our loss was four hundred ten killed one thousand eight hundred forty four wounded and one hundred and eighty seven missing hovey alone lost one thousand two hundred killed wounded and missing more than one-third of his division had mcclernand come up with reasonable promptness or had i known the ground as i did afterwards i cannot see how pemberton could have escaped with any organized force as it was he lost over three thousand killed and wounded and about three thousand captured in battle and in pursuit loring's division which was the right of pemberton's line was cut off from the retreating army and never got back to vicksburg pemberton himself fell back that night to the big black river his troops did not stop before midnight and many of them left before the general retreat commenced and no doubt a good part of them returned to their homes logan alone captured one thousand three hundred prisoners and eleven guns hovey captured three hundred under fire and about seven hundred in all exclusive of five hundred sick and wounded whom he paroled thus making one thousand two hundred mcpherson joined in the advance as soon as his men could fill their cartridge boxes leaving one brigade to guard our wounded the pursuit was continued as long as it was light enough to see the road the night of the sixteenth of may found mcpherson's command bivouacked from two to six miles west of the battlefield along the line of the road to vicksburg carr and osterhaus were at edwards station and blair was about three miles southeast hovey remained on the field where his troops had fought so bravely and bled so freely much war material abandoned by the enemy was picked up on the battlefield among it thirty pieces 
of artillery. I pushed through the advancing column with my staff and kept in advance until after night. Finding ourselves alone, we stopped and took possession of a vacant house. As no troops came up, we moved back a mile or more until we met the head of the column just going into bivouac on the road. We had no tents, so we occupied the porch of a house which had been taken for a rebel hospital and which was filled with wounded and dying who had been brought from the battlefield we had just left. While a battle is raging, one can see his enemy mowed down by the thousand or the ten thousand with great composure. But after the battle, these scenes are distressing and one is naturally disposed to do as much to alleviate the suffering of an enemy as a friend. End of section 35 Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas Jim at J-O-C-C-L-E-V dot com of personal memoirs of u s grant this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim clevenger personal memoirs of u s grant by ulysses s grant chapter thirty six battle of black river bridge Crossing the Big Black, Investment of Vicksburg, Assaulting the Works. We were now assured of our position between Johnston and Pemberton, without a possibility of a junction of their forces. Pemberton might have made a night march to the Big Black, crossed the bridge there, and by moving north on the west side, have eluded us and finally returned to Johnston. But this would have given us Vicksburg. It would have been his proper move, however, and the one Johnston would have made had he been in Pemberton's place. In fact, it would have been in conformity with Johnston's orders to Pemberton. Sherman left Jackson with the last of his troops about noon on the 16th and reached Bolton, twenty miles west before halting his rear guard did not get in until two a m the seventeenth but renewed their march by daylight he paroled his prisoners at jackson and was forced to leave his own wounded in care of surgeons and attendants at bolton he was informed of our victory he was directed to commence the march early next day and to diverge from the road he was on to Bridgeport on the Big Black River, some eleven miles above the point where we expected to find the enemy. Blair was ordered to join him there with the pontoon train as early as possible. This movement brought Sherman's corps together, and at a point where I hoped a crossing of the Big Black might be effected, and Sherman's corps used to flank the enemy out of his position in our front, thus opening a crossing for the remainder of the army. I informed him that I would endeavor to hold the enemy in my front while he crossed the river. The advance division, Carr's, McClernand's corps, resumed the pursuit at half-past three a.m. on the 17th, followed closely by Osterhaus, mcpherson bringing up the rear with his corps as i expected the enemy was found in position on the big black the point was only six miles from that where my advance had rested for the night and was reached at an early hour here the river makes a turn to the west and has washed close up to the high land the east side is a low bottom sometimes overflowed at very high water but was cleared and in cultivation. A bayou runs irregularly across this lowland, the bottom of which, however, is above the surface of the Big Black at ordinary stages. 
When the river is full, water runs through it, converting the point of land into an island. The bayou was grown up with timber, which the enemy had felled into the ditch. At this time there was a foot or two of water in it. The rebels had constructed a parapet along the inner bank of this bayou by using cotton bales from the plantation close by and throwing dirt over them. The hole was thoroughly commanded from the height west of the river. At the upper end of the bayou there was a strip of uncleared land which afforded a cover for a portion of our men. Carr's division was deployed on our right, Lawler's brigade forming his extreme right, and reaching through these woods to the river above. Osterhaus's division was deployed to the left of Carr, and covered the enemy's entire front. McPherson was in column on the road, the head close by, ready to come in wherever he could be of assistance. While the troops were standing as here described, an officer from Banks's staff came up and presented me with a letter from General Halleck dated the 11th of May. It had been sent by the way of New Orleans to Banks to be forwarded to me. It ordered me to return to Grand Gulf and to cooperate from there with Banks against Port Hudson, and then to return with our combined forces to besiege Vicksburg. I told the officer that the order came too late, and that Halleck would not give it now if he knew our position. The bearer of the dispatch insisted that I ought to obey the order, and was giving arguments to support his position, when I heard great cheering to the right of our line, and, looking in that direction, saw Lawler, in his shirt-sleeves, leading a charge upon the enemy. I immediately mounted my horse, and rode in the direction of the charge, and saw no more of the officer who delivered the dispatch, I think, not even to this day. The assault was successful, but little resistance was made. The enemy fled from the west bank of the river, burning the bridge behind him, and leaving the men and guns on the east side to fall into our hands. Many tried to escape by swimming the river. Some succeeded, and some were drowned in the attempt. Eighteen guns were captured, and 1,751 prisoners. Our loss was 39 killed, 237 wounded, and 3 missing. The enemy probably lost but few men except those captured and drowned. But for the successful and complete destruction of the bridge, I have but little doubt that we should have followed the enemy so closely as to prevent his occupying his defenses around Vicksburg. As the bridge was destroyed, and the river was high, new bridges had to be built. It was but little after nine o'clock a.m. when the capture took place. As soon as work could be commenced, orders were given for the construction of three bridges. One was taken charge of by Lieutenant Haynes of the Engineer Corps, one by General McPherson himself, and one by General Ransom a most gallant and intelligent volunteer officer. My recollection is that Haynes built a raft bridge, McPherson a pontoon using cotton bales in large numbers for pontoons, and that Ransom felled trees on opposite banks of the river, cutting only on one side of the tree, so that they would fall with their tops interlacing in the river, without the trees being entirely severed from their stumps. A bridge was then made with these trees to support the roadway. Lumber was taken from buildings, cotton gins, and wherever found for this purpose. By eight o'clock in the morning of the 18th, all three bridges were complete, and the troops were crossing. Sherman reached Bridgeport about noon of the 17th and found Blair with the pontoon train already there. A few of the enemy were entrenched on the west bank, 
but they made little resistance and soon surrendered. Two divisions were crossed that night, and the third the following morning. On the 18th, I moved along the Vicksburg Road in advance of the troops and, as soon as possible, joined Sherman. My first anxiety was to secure a base of supplies on the Yazoo River above Vicksburg. Sherman's line of march led him to the very point on Walnut Hills occupied by the enemy the December before when he was repulsed. Sherman was equally anxious with myself. Our impatience led us to move in advance of the column and well up with the advanced skirmishers. There were some detached works along the crest of the hill. These were still occupied by the enemy, or else the garrison from Haines's Bluff had not all got past on their way to Vicksburg. At all events, the bullets of the enemy whistled by thick and fast for a short time. In a few minutes, Sherman had the pleasure of looking down from the spot coveted so much by him the December before, on the ground where his command had lain so helpless for offensive action. He turned to me, saying that up to this minute he had felt no positive assurance of success. This, however, he said, was the end of one of the greatest campaigns in history, and I ought to make a report of it at once. Vicksburg was not yet captured, and there was no telling what might happen before it was taken. But whether captured or not, this was a complete and successful campaign. I do not claim to quote Sherman's language, but the substance only. My reason for mentioning this incident will appear further on. McPherson, after crossing the Big Black, came into the Jackson and Vicksburg Road, which Sherman was on, but to his rear. He arrived at night near the lines of the enemy, and went into camp. McClernand moved by the direct road near the railroad to Mount Albans, and then turned to the left and put his troops on the road from Baldwin's Ferry to Vicksburg. This brought him south of McPherson. I now had my three corps up the works built for the defense of Vicksburg on three roads, one to the north, one to the east, and one to the southeast of the city. By the morning of the 19th, the investment was as complete as my limited number of troops would allow. Sherman was on the right, and covered the high ground from where it overlooked the Yazoo as far as southeast as his troops would extend. McPherson joined on to his left, and occupied ground on both sides of the Jackson Road. McClernand took up the ground to his left, and extended as far towards Warrenton as he could, keeping a continuous line. On the 19th, there was constant skirmishing with the enemy, while we were getting into better position. The enemy had been much demoralized by his defeats at Champion Hill and the Big Black, and I believed he would not make much effort to hold Vicksburg. Accordingly, at two o'clock I ordered an assault. It resulted in securing more advanced positions for all our troops, where they were fully covered from the fire of the enemy. The 20th and 21st were spent in strengthening our position and in making roads in rear of the army from Yazoo River or Chickasaw Bayou. Most of the army had now been for three weeks with only five days' rations issued by the commissary. They had an abundance of food, however, but began to feel the want of bread. I remember that in passing around to the left of the line on the 21st, a soldier, recognizing me, said in rather a low voice, but yet so that I heard him, hard tack. In a moment the cry was taken up all along the line, Hard tack! Hard tack! I told the men nearest to me that we had been engaged ever since the arrival of the troops in building a road over which to supply them with everything they needed. The cry was instantly changed to cheers. By the night of the 21st all the troops had full rations issued to them. The bread and coffee were highly appreciated. I now determined on a second assault. 
Johnston was in my rear, only fifty miles away, with an army not much inferior in numbers to the one I had with me, and I knew he was being reinforced. There was danger of his coming to the assistance of Pemberton, and, after all, he might defeat my anticipations of capturing the garrison, if, indeed, he did not prevent the capture of the city. The immediate capture of Vicksburg would save sending me the reinforcements which were so much wanted elsewhere, and would set free the army under me to drive Johnston from the state. But the first consideration of all was, the troops believed they could carry the works in their front, and would not have worked so patiently in the trenches if they had not been allowed to try. The attack was ordered to commence on all parts of the line at 10 o'clock a.m. on the 22nd with a furious cannonade from every battery in position. All the corps commanders set their time by mine so that all might open the engagement at the same minute. The attack was gallant, and portions of each of the three corps succeeded in getting up to the very parapets of the enemy and in planting their battle flags upon them but at no place were we able to enter general mcclernand reported that he had gained the enemy's entrenchments at several points and wanted reinforcements i occupied a position from which i believed i could see as well as he what took place in his front and I did not see the success he reported. But his request for reinforcement being repeated, I could not ignore it, and sent him Quingby's division of the 17th Corps. Sherman and McPherson were both ordered to renew their assaults as a diversion in favor of McClernand. This last attack only served to increase our casualties without giving any benefit whatever. As soon as it was dark, our troops that had reached the enemy's line and been obliged to remain there for security all day were withdrawn, and thus ended the last assault upon Vicksburg. End of section 36. Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas. Jim at J-O-C-C-L-E-V dot com.